Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to speak at the Advanced Photonics Congress. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. My name is Jelena Vukovic and I will talk about our work on inverse design and implementation of practical classical and quantum photonics. And let me start by uh, repeating something that all of you already know. Uh, there are numerous applications of photonics, uh, and there is a lot of active work in, in a lot of uh, application areas today, which include optical interconnects for data centers, LiDAR systems for self-driving cars, quantum technologies, augmented reality glasses, or various sensors and imaging systems. However, pretty much all of these applications require uh, design and implementation of uh, photonic circuits that have very high density and high efficiency and could therefore fit into very small footprint that is provided by glasses or sensors or, or other systems that we're building. So is that possible to do with, with state-of-the-art photonics? Uh, so let's revisit the state-of-the-art photonics today. Unfortunately, state-of-the-art photonics doesn't really satisfy all the criteria that are necessary to build these high efficiency and high density systems that we need for various applications. Uh, first, photonics is bulky. Uh, we typically need tens of micrometers per component. Um, it also is uh, very sensitive to fabrication errors, temperature errors, which is why people have to integrate a lot of tuners and heaters that um, increase the energy consumption of a photonic circuit, but at the same time complicate the circuit tremendously. Moreover, uh, photonics is designed by manual tuning of few design parameters or by using photonic components from the, the library that is already provided, and that leads to suboptimal designs and limited functionalities for photonic components. Um, and as a result of all of this, a lot of photonic components are lossy, inefficient, for example, in optical interconnect systems, often we have to deal with uh, energy consumption of a picojoule per bit for optical interconnect, which is pretty much comparable to state-of-the-art electronics. Uh, moreover, um, we have losses uh, that are pretty large, even in commercial systems, losses are often on the order of 50% uh, or, or more for in uh, coupling of, of a signal to the circuit. So how do we address that? The question is, could we design or make better photonics so that we could uh, enable all of these wonderful applications that we discussed at the very beginning of the talk? And by better photonics, we mean better photonics performance than what we know today, higher efficiencies, smaller footprints, robustness to fabrication and environmental errors, um, and novel functionalities that would be necessary for a lot of applications. And finally, could we even eliminate nanophotonics expertise from the design process so that circuit, electronic circuit designers could also design photonics as needed? And the answer to this question is yes. Um, a number of years ago, uh, for, me, for more than a decade, my group at Stanford has been working on what we call photonic inverse design. About seven years ago, we managed to, to perform this photonics design in three-dimensional structures, which is necessary to build photonic circuits. Uh, but this booming field of research, again called uh, inverse design in photonics, um, uh, has been quite active in many groups throughout the world. And if you're interested in learning more about it, please read this review article that we wrote with Alejandro Rodriguez um, very recently. So what do we mean by inverse design? Inverse design basically combines powerful optimization and machine learning techniques with photonics design in order to implement and design better photonic circuits that satisfy particular figure of merit and functionality. So let's say you would like to design a waveguide band. Um, sharp waveguide band in a very small footprint, a figure of merit for this problem is maximizing transmission. Of course, you can build a waveguide band by, by occupying a very large footprint of the chip, but that's not what you would like to do here. So how do you maximize efficiency and also minimize footprint at the same, same time? Um, in this case, we would like to do waveguide band in a footprint of two by two micrometers. So if you just pixelate this region into 40 nanometer pixels um, and try all the possible combinations of pixels, pixels being silicon and air or silicon and oxide, you will actually have too many degrees of freedom to tune. You will basically have two to the power of 2,500 possible designs. Uh, which means that you will never really be able to reach to the, op the, to reach the optimal solution by brute forcing the problem. 
So how do you still solve this problem, even such a small problem, in a finite amount of time? Um, well, what we do is combining optimization techniques with photonic design, uh, and we typically rely on some gradient-based optimization techniques. In this case, we are still searching through this very complex uh, parameter space and changing degrees of freedom, but we are doing it um, not in a blindfolded way. Instead, we're guided by physics of the problem and uh, we calculate gradients of the, the, the field relative to a particular uh, figure of merit that we're defining. And that, those gradients tell us how to update the structure and move through the parameter space in a most efficient way, uh, guiding by the gradient of the, the structure or by the physics of the problem. Uh, calculation of gradients is, can be very time consuming, which is why we typically don't uh, do it in a brute force way. Instead, we apply uh, adjoint uh, optimization, uh, which allows us to calculate gradients from two simulations, from forward and backward uh, simulation of the structure. Uh, com by combining these two simulations, we can actually calculate gradients inside of the structure and use that to update uh, the, the uh, structure in the corresponding way. In other words, by changing the pixels that are more, uh, that are most sensitive and allow us to travel in the direction of the steepest gradient descent. And here is a movie showing how we're doing that for the problem of the waveguide band. Uh, here is how we're traveling through the parameter space and designing the waveguide band in two by two micron footprint. And here is how the field propagates through the final structure. Keep in mind that here I'm showing the two dimensional slice through the structure, but the structure is actually three dimensional. All the simulations and optimization are done in three dimensions, except that in the third dimension, the structure is slab and we constrain the geometry in third dimension in this particular case. So this was one uh, simple problem that I used to illustrate what we're doing. Um, but of course, we solved many more problems, um, many of them being even more useful than the waveguide band. Uh, here are examples of some of the um, initial structures that we designed and implemented, wavelength demultiplexers, two and three channel wavelength demultiplexers in a small footprint, smaller than three by three microns and smaller than four by five microns for two and three channels respectively. And on the right, you see measurements of transmissions through multiple devices on the chip without any post-fabrication tuning of the structure, which implies that basically without, uh, if you incorporate robustness to particular errors inside of the structure, you don't really need any additional tuning elements or heaters in order to, to tune properties of the structure. Instead, you basically just uh, obtain all of the devices that perform the same, despite fabrication errors that every process has. Um, and since we've been working on this for a long time, for more than a decade, uh, my group has developed this software that we call Stanford Photonics Inverse Design Software, or SPINS uh, for short, um, which uh, quite a few major companies have licensed out of Stanford, and right now academic groups and uh, uh, government labs can also license uh, by contacting Stanford Office of Technology Licensing. Uh, we have also released as an open source a basic version of this software called SpinsB. Uh, it is on GitHub. It is not really as powerful as the full Spins, doesn't have a nice graphic interface, but yeah, it has still some interesting functionalities that many academic researchers are using. In order to build practical photonics and uh, photonic systems, it's of course important to uh, have the design process, which is compatible with high yield uh, fabrication and high yield, high throughput fabrication is uh, foundry-based fabrication. Um, and we spent last three or four years trying to combine our uh, Photonics inverse design with the foundry based fabrication. Uh, we work right now with several foundries, uh, and uh, the results are very exciting, showing that actually inverse design is fully compatible with foundry fabrication. We just need to incorporate uh, design constraints for a particular foundry process. So here is um, uh, one of our early results uh, done in collaboration with a group of John Bowers from UC Santa Barbara and by using AIM Photonics Foundry for silicon. Uh, 
which shows that in a foundry we can actually implement uh, photonic inverse design devices and circuits with exactly the same properties as the ones that we initially fabricated using electron beam lithography and other uh, uh, parts of the process at the academic fabrication facility. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's important to incorporate uh, uh, rules, design rules from a particular foundry process. But once you do that, you can design your devices, uh, send a layout uh, to the foundry for a tape out, and you receive your devices back, which you can measure. Um, and uh, we did that for many, many different devices. Here I'll show you comparison of a three-channel wavelength splitter, the one that we uh, previously made at Stanford using electron beam lithography and etching. Uh, the same device fabricated in AIM Photonics, which you see here in optical micro image. Um, here is the theoretically predicted behavior for transmission through the structure for all three channels and measured uh, performance for the device fabricated in the foundry shown here. Uh, this is not for one device, this is for many devices that we measured and they all performed the same despite uh, some fabrication errors and they performed the same because we incorporated fabrication constraints into the design process. There are no tuning elements here. So again, uh, foundry-based fabrication is fully compatible with photonics inverse design. I would like to spend a few minutes apart from showing that you can design more efficient or more compact elements, showing you that you can also uh, use this inverse design process to implement new functionalities, which is crucial for building uh, photonic circuits for a variety of applications, because our known library of photonic devices is very limited and we miss uh, and lack a lot of functionalities. So first example that I'd like to share with you is the example of non-reciprocal transmission and routing in passive silicon photonics. Um, in this case, uh, we designed a non-reciprocal element, uh, which uh, enables you to do isolation for optical pulses inside of a photonic circuit. Um, and typically, doing something like this re requires either magneto-optic materials or some, some sophisticated um, um, structures that are quite complicated um, to, to implement because they require dynamic tuning. Uh, here, we achieve non-reciprocal transmission and routing in passive silicon photonics just by inverse designing the circuit, um, which was designed um, which was based on the idea from the group of Andrea Alou uh, at City University of New York, uh, where the main idea is to use a cascade of a Lorentzian and final resonator, enable different coupling to the circuit in forward and backward direction, and uh, as a result of the intrinsic nonlinearity in the system, in this case, chi tree nonlinearity, uh, transmission characteristics of the system would uh, exhibit different shift um, in the forward and backward propagation direction as a result of different coupling to the structure. And as a result of that, at the laser frequency, you would have um, strong transmission in a forward direction, small transmission in the backward direction. Although this had been previously demonstrated uh, in microwave circuit, uh, the problem with demonstration in photonic circuits was that um, people couldn't really design all the uh, corresponding necessary elements and uh, they couldn't design them manually. But of course, if you rely on uh, inverse design, you can very easily uh, essentially define transmission characteristics over the system, uh, Lorentzian and final resonance, and then let the, the uh, inverse design software spins in this case, these, the, define all of these elements for you. So here our circuit is based on two, two resonators coupled to a waveguide, and we're inverse designing coupling elements between resonators and waveguide to achieve desired transmission characteristics characteristics. Uh, transmission characteristics is uh, basically um, here shown as a final resonator, uh, here as a Lorentzian resonator. Uh, you here see the evolution of the inverse design. Uh, and once you reach the final uh, design of the coupling elements, uh, they would look like, like something shown here in a very small footprint. And then you implement those elements uh, measure transmission and it matches theoretical behavior given by the red curve. So with this, you expect to observe non-reciprocal transmission, and indeed that is what, what we achieve uh, if you send, if you are in the regime, uh, in the range of powers where you expect non-reciprocal behavior, you see only propagation of the forward pulses in the orange slots, but you don't see propagation of the backward pulses. Uh, if you are outside of the dynamic range of non-reciprocal propagation, then you are not blocking backward pulses. 
So this uh, non-reciprocal behavior can also be performed at high speed. Uh, we demonstrated that we could do this isolation uh, at even 10 gigahertz rate, as shown here, where you are transmitting forward signal but blocking backward signal. Uh, what are the possible applications of this? Um, well, uh, we think that one of the main um, applications of this particular um, circuit is the use in optical ranging measurement, where instead of uh, complicated, um, energy consuming, uh, and lossy switches, uh, you can just use this one of these elements in order to route the reflected signal uh, in the ranging system and send it towards the detector. So basically you will be able to forward propagate the pulses, but then reflected pulses uh, that are backward propagated would not go into a laser. Instead, they would be routed into a detector. And we use this circuit to perform ranging measurements for up to 60 meter distances. Um, it is important that we can do it with very high speed and we can also do it with very small insertion loss. It's fully passive and has much smaller footprint than any of the other uh, electro-optic switches and modulators that people have um, used for similar applications recently. The other application that I would like to highlight um, as another functionality enabled by inverse design is uh, the idea of uh, on-chip integrated laser-driven particle accelerator. All of you know uh, and have heard uh, about uh, particle accelerators. Uh, you know that they are large, they rely on microwave or radio frequency signals to all accelerate particles. And since you need to accelerate them to very large uh, energies, uh, then you also need very large lengths of accelerator. You go to many, many stages of acceleration. Uh, however, uh, if you use optical fields instead of microwave or radio frequency fields, uh, the accelerator size in principle would scale uh, as in proportion with the wavelength of light that you are using in the system. So you can achieve 10,000 fold reduction in accelerator if you rely on infrared light instead of using radio frequency waves. And that would allow you to, in principle, implement 30 micrometer long accelerator stage or shrink files of accelerator to only a few inches on a trip. People had demonstrated uh, some preliminary acceleration in some proof of concept structures in the past, but nobody had demonstrated uh, scalable stages of accelerator that we could be cascaded in order to go to mega electron volt acceleration eventually, which is useful for practical applications. Um, the main problem was that uh, stages of accelerator would have to be designed for uh, optical excitation wavelengths, so they cannot really be directly mapped and shrunk from radio frequency stages. And here we used inverse design to, to inverse design stages of accelerator so that we provide for the input electron beam acceleration in the direction of propagation through the vacuum wavefront inside of the accelerator. And in addition, we have input coupler, uh, which allow us to couple light from the uh, laser source and uh, guide it towards the vacuum waveguide where light is accelerated. This non-intuitive design provides greater than 30 mega electron volt per meter acceleration gradient. Uh, we only demonstrated single acceleration stage, but with about 100 to 1,000 of these stages, um, we should be able to reach mega electron volt energies. Um, the input electrons have about 80 kilo electron volt energy. They come from a modified electron beam writer. So we will be able to reach the range which is necessary for practical applications. And here are our practical results, um, experimental results. Uh, when you couple electrons from your modified electron beam, you measure them at the output, uh, you, they will just have the same energy as the input electrons. But when you turn the laser beam on, you will also see electrons that are accelerated. And these ac electrons are uh, having uh, acceleration gradient of 30 mega electron volts per meter. So that's uh, on par with state-of-the-art radio frequency accelerators. So now I would like to shift gears and spend the rest of my talk uh, telling you about uh, use of inverse design uh, to build practical quantum photonics. And as you all know, there is a lot of interest these days in quantum technologies uh, for quantum computers, quantum networks, quantum simulators, quantum sensors. 
Um, all of these applications are just different flavors of exactly the same thing. In order to implement all of these technologies, you need homogeneous long-lived quantum bits, qubits, which have good interfaces, preferably optical interfaces, but in some cases there are microwave interfaces, for example, like for superconducting qubits. And you also need to interconnect them efficiently, again, preferably using optical interconnections, uh, which would eventually enable building uh, larger networks of these uh, technologies. So now I will go through both of these uh, ingredients and describe you how we plan to uh, build scalable quantum technologies using semiconductor platforms. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to spend some time telling you about our choice of quantum bits or qubits. Our choice of qubits are optically interface semiconductor spin qubits. For example, uh, spins of an electron inside of a uh, color center, impurity inside of a semiconductor, such as uh, spin of an electron um, inside of uh, silicon vacancy in diamond or silicon vacancy in silicon carbide, and then we build optical resonator, optical structure around this quantum bit. If you look at the physics of the problem, uh, our color center inside of an optical resonator is a completely equivalent to a superconducting qubit inside of a microwave cavity, such as the one shown, shown on the left. Um, and there are some differences. Equations, same equations govern the behavior. Physics is pretty much the same. But on the left, you have a system that has a large scale that you build by traditional microfabrication. You define everything by lithography, which is also implying that you can build all of the qubits the same. And that's part of the reason why uh, all of these superconducting quantum bits have been scaled much faster uh, and much better than some of the other platforms. But in that case, you have to deal with superconductors, you work with microwave frequencies, and you have no direct optical interface, which is why a lot of people are now working on quantum transductions in order to map somehow these microwave quantum bits to optical interfaces. On the right-hand side, you already have optical interface, right? So these are optically in interfaced uh, color centers. You work with semiconductors. Um, you have possibility of operation at higher temperatures. You don't need to use the ocean refrigerators. You can use closed cycle cryostats that are less expensive, easier to use. Um, and um, maybe most importantly, um, the number of two qubit gate operations, non-trivial operations that you can do per electron spin qubit coherence time is much greater than for these superconducting qubits, which means that eventually you should be able to build larger depth quantum circuits with this platform. But what is the problem? I mean, there is no free lunch. In this case, uh, you are working with a platform where everything is smaller by uh, several orders of magnitude. Uh, you have to use non-standard fabrication methods, both to introduce qubits and to fabricate circuits, uh, which is why it's much more challenging to make them all the same and that uh, it has uh, um, basically uh, made scaling of these platforms difficult, but not impossible. So what are we doing? Uh, well, first, as for qubits, we're primarily interested in color centers in diamond and in silicon carbide, silicon vacancy and tin vacancy in diamond. Um, what is the state of the art? Our team and other groups, such as the team at Harvard, have shown excellent photonic interfaces for silicon vacancy in diamond. Uh, we have shown uh, that we have small spectral broadenings in homogeneity, only 30 gigahertz of spectral inhomogeneity between different silicon vacancy color centers on the same chip. And we have shown that we can compensate for up to 100 gigahertz of spectral broadening by using off-resonant laser driving. So we can compensate for all of the inhomogeneity, for example, by using driving with different lasers. And more recently, we've been looking into tin vacancy color centers in diamond, uh, which are even more exciting than silicon vacancies, in my opinion, because they promise all of the advantages of silicon vacancies. Uh, but at elevated temperatures, and you don't uh, need to use dilution refrigerators uh, as for silicon vacancies, and you uh, also achieve higher efficiency than for silicon vacancies. <clears throat> Again, here you work with uh, single impurities inside of diamond, in this case, or other semiconductors. So introducing them in a controllable manner uh, is quite challenging because that also means that you have to precisely control position where you're introducing impurity and control their environment. In the past, our team and others have generally used high energy implantation 
uh, into the structure to introduce these impurities. But that also introduces damage and introducing lifts the, uh, uh, the, it ruins the symmetry of the structure and also affects the color centers in a negative way. Instead, we wanted to develop a method where we can introduce uh, color centers in regular arrays inside of the structure with minimal damage. And with our collaborators in Nick Milosh's group and Ziek Shen's group at Stanford, we developed a so-called SIG method, a shallow ion implantation and subsequent diamond overgrowth that exactly allows you to introduce color centers at desired positions with minimal damage to the structure. The idea is pretty simple. You mask high purity diamond, you bombard it with low energy ions uh, of silicon or tin, and uh, that leads to shallow implantation close to the surface. Then you grow a high purity layer on top to cap these color centers. And as a result, you have regular arrays of thin vacancies here, a minimal damage into the structure, which uh, leads to uh, elimination of some unwanted peaks in the spectrum that are a result of damage, as you see here in the blue spectrum. And you also achieve much narrower lines of the transitions of the color center, again, as a result of the uh, much lower damage to the structure. So our color centers are now in diamond introduced this very, by using this very simple method that, that leads to superior properties. Uh, the other color center of our interests are silicon vacancies in 4-H silicon carbide, which we also use uh, extensively. These are basically uh, absences of silicon atoms inside of a 4-H silicon carbide lattice. Uh, we um, like these car centers a lot because they have a long electron spin coherence time of 20 milliseconds. Um, they also uh, can lead to indistinguishable photons generation at the output and have very, very narrow line with transitions. We've been collaborating actively with a group of Jörg Rachtrup in Stuttgart and uh, Rupp Sophia Economo on these particular color centers. And they have a very good stability in time. If you look at the transitions over many hours, they're very, very stable. And you can also tune them uh, by hundreds of gigahertz by using DC start shift, just by depositing electrodes next to the color centers, as you can see here. Apart from DC start shift tuning, uh, we have also recently demonstrated that if you tune it with high speed microwave signals that are faster than the decay time uh, of the emitters inside of these color centers, uh, you can uh, achieve the regime of generation of beautiful bloquet eigenstates. And instead of seeing just two lines in the spectrum, as you would see under um, slow speed tuning, you will see this spectrum of lines, which are basically eigenstates of the periodically driven Hamiltonian. And from the time result measurements, we also proved that we're performing experiments uh, on a single color center in this case. Although floquet eigenstates sound like something that would only be of fundamental interest, it actually has a lot of exciting uh, practical applications. This fast microwave driving is very uh, interesting. This fast modulation is very interesting because it can enable you to achieve fully spectrally reconfigurable quantum emitters. Basically, instead of just driving them with a single harmonic or microwave field, you can optimize the driving field, you can use multiple harmonics, and uh, as a result, uh, you can completely shape the spectrum of your color center at the output. Instead of having just two lines, you can have a forest of lines and control the amplitude of different lines just simply by changing driving. And this is shown here. Uh, ex in experimental results for our color centers under two color microwave drive or under four color microwave drive. Moreover, uh, if you do full optimization of the microwave driving, you can even use same effect in order to compensate inhomogeneous broadening of the system by dynamic modulation. I told you at the very beginning of this part of my talk that the main issue with using color centers or spins in semiconductors in order to build scalable quantum systems is the problem with achieving all qubits to be the same uh, because they're heavily influenced by the local environment. And if you would like to compensate for errors between qubits or inhomogeneous broadening, you would need to tune each one of them separately. And that makes the problem quite complicated. However, uh, we have recently shown that we can uh, use a similar approach 
uh, where we applied electrodes to a system of a few emitters, and we hope that it would also work for a large number of emitters, and then just apply optimized microwave field. And as a result of this, we can compensate in homogeneous rubbing in the system. So in this case, you know, we start from the system of three homogeneously broadened electron spins inside of the cavity. If you measure transmission through the system, you would not really see anything interesting. They're decoupled from the cavity. But if you drive them at the same time by the optimized microwave signal, you will see Rabi splitting of the cavity because they become collectively coupled to the cavity residues. And we are actively working uh, in collaboration with the group of Ignacio Sirac in Munich on extending this to a large system of emitters, because in this case, the approach is very simple. You can build, let's say, 100 atom simulator, uh, even with the homogeneously broadened emitters, just by applying single set of electrons on, on your structure to compensate for the broadening. Um, as I mentioned, apart from having homogeneous long-lived qubits with good optical interfaces, it's also important to have efficient optical interconnects in order to build scalable quantum systems. And for quantum systems, this may be even more of a pressing issue than for classical systems, because in most cases, a lot of information is contained in the state of a single photon. So you cannot really work with uh, couplers and devices that have few percent efficiency. Uh, except in the case when you're maybe working with something like a single emitter in the cavity and doing proof of concept demonstrations of a single node. And this is how we and others have made the demonstrations of these small scale systems. But moving on to larger systems would require really uh, using connections that have nearly 100% efficiency or 100% efficiency. So how do we plan to go about it? Uh, well, we have to also rely on optimized photonic st structures connecting your homogeneous qubits. And we've been doing that both in diamond and in silicon carbide. In diamond, uh, we are using our inverse design approach combined with a diamond fabrication method, uh, relying on isotropic and anisotropic etching that was first developed by uh, Paul Barclay in Calgary. Uh, we adopted and developed it further. Uh, and this is essentially three-dimensional carving of diamond blocks, which allows you to fabricate any types of structures that are optimized for a particular function. And this leads to tremendous improvements in the properties of your, your diamond circuits, uh, which I'll illustrate here with a very simple example of couplers. If you're looking at a transmission through a resonator, using this simple notch couplers with 1% efficiency, you have to integrate for 10 seconds and you barely start seeing some signatures of the cavity. If you optimize couplers to the structure um, with very simple designs of same footprint, you can achieve 30% efficiency. After only one second of integration, you are already seeing very strong signal from the cavity. So you have 500 fold enhancement in counts um, and dramatic reduction in the experimental time, which are, would allow you to actually scale this further to a large number of nodes and circuits. We are now combining this with color centers, primarily tin vacancies. Uh, recently, we have shown that we can embed tin vacancy color center inside of such a diamond circuit with optimized coupler. We preserve very narrow line width comparable to the line width of color centers in bulk. Um, and we're now uh, moving further to uh, combining and interacting multiple color centers via diamond circuits. The other material that we are actively working on is silicon carbide. Um, silicon carbide is a very interesting material for quantum photonics because of the color centers and the ability to make good high quality photonics. But it's also a very interesting photonics material because of the strong optical uh, nonlinearity, being piezoelectric, good thermal conductivity, silicon compatibility, availability of wafer scale, um, and a large band gap. And um, I'd like to remind you just of the history of uh, photonics, um, that basically silicon photonics um, kicked off about 20 years ago uh, as a result of the commercialization of silicon on insulator wafers. And likewise, about 10 years ago, we've seen a great boom in thin film lithium niobate photonics, again enabled by commercializing thin film lithium niobate on insulator. And although we believe that silicon carbide is a much better photonics material than both of these two, uh, silicon or, or lithium niobate, uh, because no other material allows you to do everything that's highlighted on top of this slide, um, as of now, there is no really 
a commercial high quality silicon carbide on insulator, although some companies are trying to develop and market it now. But we can actually get uh, very high quality bulk silicon carbide wafers, uh, even 60 inch wafers from companies like Cree. For that reason, uh, my team developed a process for producing pristine films of silicon carbide on insulator. Uh, we do this by uh, basically bonding uh, and grinding, thinning uh, silicon carbide, uh, bonded on oxidized uh, silicon. And we can produce few by few millimeters, very high purity films of silicon carbide, which enable uh, extraordinary quality of photonics. Um, this is not really limited by few by few to few by few millimeters. In principle, with different tools, you could actually go to much larger scales. This is what we can do in a university facility. But few by few millimeters is enough to build very, very large photonic circuits, especially optimized circuits that occupy a small footprint. We have excellent quality factors exceeding 1.1 million completely comparable to silicon photonics. We can actually implement optimized structures. Uh, we um, can inverse design couplers to resonators. Uh, these are measurements of 1.1 million Q factor in transmission through the resonator. And I already mentioned that silicon carbide has strong secondary pair optical nonlinearity. Uh, we have seen um, measured effects of uh, uh, nonlinear interaction inside of these structures, uh, efficient second harmonic generation. And also recently, we've shown uh, optical parametric oscillation and demonstration of microcombs inside of these silicon carbide circuits with very low thresholds of only a few milliwatts. As for quantum photonics, we have shown that we can couple color centers to these silicon carbide circuits without degradation. Uh, when they are in resonance with the structure, their emission is enhanced by a factor greater than 100. Uh, their lifetime is reduced. Um, we see strong per cell enhancement. And we're actively moving towards uh, implementing larger scale circuits uh, which uh, enable interaction of a large number of color centers and at the same time enable reconfiguration of the circuit because no matter what quantum platform you use, you will always have issues that not all qubits are exactly the same or perfect. So you need some level of reconfigurability that people are also in other platforms achieving either with optical tweezers or some tuning elements. What we plan to do is use silicon carbide platform with another layer of nitride on top in order to connect um, high quality quantum nodes inside of the circuit and use this to reconfigure the circuit itself and achieve uh, high functionality. So in summary, I hope I managed to relate to you that photonics optimization is critical for implementation of scalable and practical classical and quantum photonic systems. Uh, we have developed uh, software, SPINs, uh, which is available for, for uh, licensing by both industry and uh, government labs and uh, by academia. Uh, in fact, a lot of academic labs uh, and uh, industrial labs already use it for their work. Uh, we also have a basic open source version if you would like to learn more about it. And this uh, inverse design is fully compatible with founded publication. Um, we have used this to uh, not only to improve efficiencies, reduce footprints of traditional circuits and increase their robustness, but we have also used this to implement new functionalities such as non reciprocal optical ranging measurement on silicon chip, laser driven particle accelerator on a silicon chip, and we're actively using it to implement quantum circuits both in silicon carbide and in diamond. And with that, I would like to uh, finish my talk acknowledge our collaborators, our funding, and also my research group, my team. Um, I already acknowledged them throughout my talk. And I'd also like to thank you all for your attention. And again, thank you for the invitation.